So this is our third episode. Hi hey everybody, this is Corey. And that's your cue, Trisha. I don't know if you tr- froze or not. Hi, Trisha. It's Corey and Trisha. We're still doing our Zoom podcast. This is the Cheshire Cast. Uh, it is very difficult to get uh, a handle on doing these things remotely like this. Um, it, it really just completely changes the d- dynamic of everything, but it's what we have to do. We're still dealing with uh, uh, COVID-19. We are um, physically distancing. Yes, physically <laughs> right. distancing. Physically. I, I like that yeah. so much better than the social distancing thing. But I'll tell you what. There's a touch of both. I went to um, I went to Pop's Pizza. I ordered some cauliflower pizza and uh, ordered the kids some pizza. Went and picked it up, and I noticed how much social distancing is going on when I drove through the completely full parking lots of the Linear Trail. And I I just don't think people are getting it yet. I think that they're um, you know, they have this, it won't happen to me mentality mm-hmm. and it gets a little bit frustrating, uh, quickly. Um, I've been reading some terrible things in the news and I'm trying to keep my, my, uh, mental state positive. Um, you know, and, uh, yeah, trying to stay away from the news the past couple of days, trying, I, you know, I took my, uh, I had, I had a tracker up on my, um, uh, up on my wall that I took down. Uh, just trying to yeah. disconnect from it a little bit, but mm-hmm. uh, I don't know. How are you doing, Trish? Uh, I f- sometimes I feel underinformed, and other times I feel overinformed. But I, I think there's got to be a comfortable place for me somewhere in the middle. I, I do better with information, but with this day and age, um, the information that's coming in is not comforting. So it's it's tough to want the information to feel better, but then the information that you get doesn't make you feel better. So it's <laughs> it's a a huge learning experience, I think, for everybody. And um, uh, in our town, we've technically just recently moved into a a spread type of situation where we're going to be watching numbers in our own town. And I think that's something that you know everybody's going to move into in their own timeline. And it's sure. I have family that's further further away from an epicenter from a from the big numbers and it's i'm watching as their towns start to go into the the shutdown modes and they start to take it more seriously as the numbers click in and it's it's a time in our lives that we hopefully will never have to live through again and i just can't wait to get onto the the other side of this where we are um healing healing rather than being being more more tragic news shared every day and you're it's sitting tough. across from me again <laughs> yeah right and i can i could you know verbally abuse you in person yes so much easier it would be so much <laughs> better um on today's show though uh we we do have somebody who can probably help us with some answers that uh uh you know we've been looking for and um it's it's nice to have um you know another state rep with us uh we have Leslie Zupkis from the 89th District. Hi, Leslie. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. Welcome to the show. It's nice to virtually meet you. (laughs) I know. You too. You too. So that's better. So we were just dealing with some technical difficulties. Um, We went over that uh, you're on your your fourth term in the 89th District. You are our state representative here, uh, Mm -hmm. representing parts of Bethany Cheshire and all of Prospect. Uh, you live in Prospect. I do. You've been there for how long? Oh my gosh, I've been here thirty, well, about thirty years. Um, Prospect has an interesting accent. <laughs> <laughs> I come. It doesn't from, sa- I come from the south of Prospect. <laughs> okay, I figured South had something to do with it because I've heard Connecticut accents for the last few years, and that doesn't sound like anything. I've heard. Yeah, well, just below Prospect, you didn't know it, Tricia, is uh, Mississippi. Yes, that makes sense. So, um, that's where you're originally from, right? I'm originally from Mississippi. Yeah. Born and raised there. And how'd you get up here? I went to college in Florida, met my husband and uh, he was born and raised in Waterbury and moved up to be with him. But the interesting thing is as a little girl, I always said, I'd love to live in Connecticut someday. Careful what you wish for, because it happened. 
<laughs> not only do you live here, but you represent us like, to the state. Yeah. Look at that. Which is an honor. So thank you. Well, how did, how did you get into, into politics as it is? Well, it's uh, interesting. You know, growing up, we always followed somewhat. My parents were never involved in politics, but followed locally and federally what was going on, just, you know, to be up on, on what's happening. And when I moved up here, my husband was involved. And um, I love people. I love helping people. That's my passion in life is to make a difference for people for the better. And um, got introduced to some people and they kept telling me to run. And I was like, no, 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 can't do it. You know, and then Mm. we got kids. um, We adopted our first daughter and people were still on me to run. And it just wasn't the time. And finally, we got to a place in our lives where I could. And so um, I ran and won. And, um, you know, it's been uh, a a great experience. great experience because the people you meet and are able to help and the differences you make is really an awesome thing. Um, so yeah. Sorry. Everything's making noise over here and scaring the hell out of me. Um, I, I'm usually the one to turn off everything and yell at everybody else. I forgot. I got things buzzing. I'm sorry about that. Um, as you're saying that I'm turning off all of mine. Yeah. Like we skip that in sound check. Unbelievable. Um, it, listen, listen, these t- strange times. Strange <laughs> days indeed, as they say. That's right. So, I mean, being in politics, I know, is, is, is a, a massive time commitment, and it's very difficult, but you're also part of the growing trend of women in politics. Mm-hmm. And um, even, even in your, your four terms... Have you seen that trend changing and and are women becoming, do you feel that women are becoming more respected as politicians than ever before? Um, Well, you know, I mean, I haven't been in that long to, um, uh, you know, to say respected or not. I have seen a uh, a more women getting involved. Um, I think women, I know even for me, you know, when, before I got in, it was, you have kids and you're raising a family and you're working and, you know, you're doing all of these things. And, um, we had, uh, up until our, our numbers are now, are we're in a minority of quite a a lot actually, but, you know, we have a woman leader, uh, Themis Claritas, who's a women leader. We have, um, a lot of women in the house right now, um, which I think is great. Um, so yeah, I think, I think women are, um, you know, getting more involved. Um, I'm not a housewife. I never was that kind of type. I always wanted to be out and making a difference. And, um, I even see it in my career outside of politics. Um, yeah, women are, are working and, and, uh, becoming more, um, in tune, uh, with what's going on. And, and I mean, look at, look at Trisha. Right. You're on the show and um, a a big personality just like you are. So um, I think it's great. I think it's great for women. I think it's great for everybody, actually, to be involved in politics because it affects all of us. So whether you're a male or a female, I think it's very important. So you think eventually I'll just give in to everybody asking me to run all the time? (laughs) (laughs) That's up to you. (laughs) Of all the things people ask you to do, that's the one you're going to hold on to, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I guess I got a list I got to chip down. That's the shortest trip anyway, probably. Yeah, well, no, it's it's a long list. It <laughs> you know, it, it's quite interesting because it's it's hard to find people to run sometimes because you have to be at a, a certain place in your life. Mm-hmm. where you, And I mean, let's face it, we certainly don't do it for the money. Um, it takes a lot of time. Uh, one thing that I have really learned through this whole coronavirus uh, experience that's been happening is to slow my life down a little bit because, you know, my family knew what it meant for me to run and be involved in politics, but I miss stuff. I, I was never at my kids' cross country meets or swim meets and mm. all, and, and I'm not complaining about that. It's just a reality. So, sure. um, you know, it's hard to find people that can take a pay cut or, or have the time to be able to be and, and 
are able to be away from their families for so much. This day and age, you also have to accept uh, being in the public eye. It's gotten a little bit crueler and you have to be able to accept that and expose your family to it. It's it's truly becoming a deterrent for people to want to run for public office. And I, I hope that's not the trend, the continued trend, mm. but um, times have been rough. For, yeah, you got to have a thicker skin, I think, than ever before to be in politics. I mean, you know, I think in, in my past, I, I've been many things. One of them was uh, a musician and musicians have always kind of like actors have always fallen uh, under some sort of cri- critical eye. You know, they were always getting write ups on their records or write, written up in magazines, this, that, and the other thing. And, you know, under the eye of mainstream and I don't I don't know that until I'd say maybe the last 20 years 25 years I don't think politicians fell under that same sort of scrutiny and uh that that uh constant barrage of public opinion um that they they have now I mean now more than ever uh mm-hmm. it's twitter it's it's uh uh Facebook, um, Instagram. I mean, I can't even name them all. Yeah. Um, and and it's just it's a constant barrage of of bullying and insults and any number of things. And I, I'm I'm shocked at some of the things I read, and I'm shocked at the way some some of the politicians are actually well, able to crazy. handle it. Well, also, when it comes to politics, you guys also have to not only have an opinion, you're, you have to hold an opinion, especially if you're going to vote on it, but it has to be an educated opinion and it, it, it can't hold more weight than your constituents. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a balancing act. And some of the things that you guys have in the forefront right now, vaccinations, uh, pro-life, or, or it, those things people feel very strongly about, religious aspects. And that's, those are issues that people are willing to go to the mats for more so than probably any other stuff you'll encounter just in life. And, you know, people have opinions on a stoplight or a stop sign that you might have to deal with and negotiate <laughs> through. That's a little bit easier to negotiate through than, than um, you know, even a budget's easier to negotiate through than vaccinations. And I, I mean, some of the stuff you guys have to vote on make people just feel and they come to you with that. Yeah, you know, I um, that's very true. And um, I think in talking about women before and women being in politics, I think the one thing that we as women have to remember is when you're in the political realm, you have to take emotion out of it. And you really have to look at it, um, uh, you know, kind of as a whole, but I, you know, I'm a believer. I, I have, I hear both sides of the story. I think we can learn from each other. And I think that, um, we can always, there's always something on the other side of our opinion that we can learn from and probably agree with. Um, I think that, um, if I, and how I do it is I listen to my constituents. I'm fortunate. Um, our constituents, no, we don't agree with everything. My husband and I don't agree with everything, you know, um, but I, I feel like that uh, my, the majority of my constituents were pretty much um, on the same side as a lot of issues. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, if I can be honest and listen and caring and understanding and put my head on my pillow at night, knowing that I've done everything I could possibly do um, with good intentions and respect and honor and grace, the and dignity and standing in your principles. I've done the best that I can do. And basically, ultimately, you have to just represent the people that have voted you. That's right. That they've get, they've given you their voice. That's yep. right. And you you have to use it as you seem, you know, as you as you deem fit, as you think that your, your voting populace wants you to do. That's, That's right. Absolutely. And, and it's, you know, it, at, at best it's 50, 50 at best. 
Well, you know, it's funny because anytime you get into the political world and you put an initial behind your name, whether it's an R or a D, 50% of the people don't like you instantly. <laughs> you know, they've already kind of summed you up as who they think that you are. And that's what I find the most uh, frustrating at times and interesting is people will say to me, uh, you know, I had a woman and she emailed me and blasted me. I mean, really crossed the line um, of being disrespectful and just horrible. And I called her and I, I approached her on it and I said, you, you know, she, she, um, put me in a category. And I said, you, you really haven't done your homework because you didn't know how I voted on something prior to this. And it is exactly what you're saying. So I think sometimes, um, it, it would help us all if we all listen a little more and engage, you know, engage, um, with respect and dignity, um, but, but listen to each other. And I, I think we were talking about this earlier as, you know, people online can say things and do things, but if they, um, I like meeting people and I will talk to somebody uh, for coffee, whoever they are. And I think it's so important to do that. And once you do that, you really almost come to a, a consensus pretty much almost all the time. A little things here and there you don't agree with, but if, if I talk to you and look at you and see your expressions and hear you in your voice versus over some keyboard, it makes a whole lot of difference. I, don't I know that? <laughs> right, Trish? <laughs> it, it happens all the time. So what, uh, man, kind of a loaded question because there's so many ways you can answer, but what, what's going on in Hartford right now? Like, uh, you know, the, 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 the primary thing is the COVID. So what in, you know, is it, in whatever summary you can put it, I mean, what, what, what should we expect over the next week or two? Well, you know, if, if we had a crystal ball to know that answer, I think we would all be in better shape. But um, well, as far as Hartford, I mean, you know, we are not in session. Um, we started this uh, session in uh, February and we had some committee meetings. We did have some public hearings, but we really did not get far into the session at all. And this took over. I don't necessarily see us going back um, until it's over. It is over May 5th. Um, and we have to, You ha session has to end May 5th at midnight. Now, that doesn't mean that we cannot be brought into for a special session. But only things that had a public hearing can be voted on. And special session is supposed to be only to deal with the budget. Now, that is something that we haven't dealt with this session. Um, so we're going to have to, I, I cannot say that we would not come back in and have to deal with some of that. because that's, Is there anything that you guys can do remotely? Um, no. I mean, it's in the Constitution that you have to be there unless it's somehow changed. But we would have to vote on that. I know at one point um, we were talking about, you know, before the governor started doing some of these executive orders, we're going in and maybe some people would go in and vote, you know, kind of in stages. And then a couple other people would go in. Um, but I, I don't I don't see that happening. Um, I think that we, we will have to go in at some point and do something with the budget. I mean, that's going to have to happen. So even. Even to do this remotely, like we're doing this show right now, there would have to be a, cons a Connecticut constitutional mm -hmm. amendment. Yeah. Which would still have to go in to vote for anyway, right? So it's, yikes. Yeah, I, just, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this has never happened before. Right? Yeah. It's, um, it... Yeah. And you can't have committee meetings because you can't have public hearings like this. You know, how long would that take for a public hearing? You know. Oh. It's, Forget it. So um, it, it's wow. um, it's very interesting in uncharted waters in in every aspect. I think it really we're we're all kind of caught unprepared. The mm -hmm. government is unprepared for these dynamics for sure. And I hope moving forward that maybe a contingency is is planned for and mm -hmm. things like this can be. I mean, all the way up to to you know Congress and Senate because these are these. Times are strange, but these may not be unique. So it's something that maybe should be 
um, contingency planned for moving forward. Once we clear this hurdle, which is still obviously so still up in the air, but um, moving forward, maybe legislation could be passed for times like these. Yeah. Well, in, I mean, even a simple thing, I was on a call today with um, the Connecticut Hospital Association, and we were talking about masks and not having enough, you know, uh, personal protection equipment, PPE, and so masks and gowns and gloves. And so um, one person on the call mentioned that the masks are coming from China, like they have a plane and the plane's literally flying and going to pick up this stuff from China. And I said, oh, my goodness, we, you know, no one has died in China in like three weeks or no, no one else has gotten this this virus. And so I'm not confident about information coming out of China. But what I never realized was is, number one, these are all made in China. And number two, all of our meds, most of our medicine is made in China. And so the, the generics. Yeah. yeah. So to your right, point, right. I, mean, I really hope, you know, and even beyond that, our schools. I mean, I, you know, I know your kids, my kids are, I have a sixth grader and trying to do school from home. So there's just so many uh, aspects of this that we are not um Prepared. We gave up our manufacturing oh. to China a very long time ago. That was most most countries did. China is a manufacturer. We we are America is the country of consumers to to start manufacturing back in the states. I, I mean, this is this crisis. It, we're in a national crisis. That's I'm not overstating that. I don't think oh. is exposing <laughs> so many aspects of of. Uh, changes and where we are as a country that I think when this is done and we when the dust settles and we're able to look at this in a cognitive type of way I think it should bring us closer together as a nation Mm -hmm. and together as a nation is how we're going to have to tackle some of these issues that are really being exposed not only now but in the last month year maybe maybe six years I don't know and you know the Bringing manufacturing back to the United States is not the worst no. aspect that might come out of this. Made in America, right? You know, yep. it, it does make me, I sit on the board of a manufacturing company and um, it's, and we've been talking about this and, and, and doing more stuff here. And, and it is, I mean, I, I'm a believer in America first and I'm proud to be in this country. I'd rather be in this country than, anywhere else. Um, and I, I, I do, I, I love America and have so much faith in us. And I think you're right to, there's nothing wrong with using what we make and what we do for us. It'd be interesting to see how it shakes out. And, and if, if that happens and they can do that, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see, uh, manufacturing cities like Detroit come back to life, you know, I mean, all over. I mean, even even you know your home state, Mississippi, could uh, uh, certainly be <laughs> it would benefit greatly from that. I mean, we've talked about Mississippi on the show before. So, although I'll tell you, my mom, because companies keep moving down there, and she's like, "Keep sending them on, Leslie." I'm <laughs> like, "No, stop. We don't want." To do <laughs> no, no, we, mom, we don't want companies to leave Connecticut. <laughs> no, let it go anywhere. The way the way things work is it evolves. And if if certain yes. manufacturing moves to a certain place in the United States, let them have it. New manufacturing, tech, whatever it may be, will take over where that one left from. Usually that's the way things evolve. Well I'd really yeah. like some more industry here in Connecticut so I don't have to go where the jobs are. <laughs> yeah. You know I'd, well, I'd li- I like I like tech? living here. Yes yeah, some aren't tech. you in tech? And the house is where your industry is. You could do that from home. No, you you can, but some sometimes they you know want you. I think there's going to be a whole WFH, a whole work from home revolution after this is done. You know, but maybe. I've, I kind of agree with you. I think companies are really looking to say, "Hey, I think we can do it a little differently." Yeah. So it save will... them money in in location fees, right? Absolutely. You can do call centers from people's home. Look, that's one less. But then it's an empty building, unfortunately. Leslie, what do you um, what do, what do you what do you do? What's your career? Um, I work. I run a nonprofit, Best Buddies. Uh huh. And um, I mean, we're going through times too. We're we're going through um, tough times also. 
And what what is that? Um, we're a, a, a we work on a volunteer basis, and we create leadership skills, integrated employment, and one to one friendships with, with people with and without disabilities. Okay. So we have a huge program at Cheshire High School. We have a huge program at Quinnipiac. Um, we're in seventy five schools throughout the state. And your uh, this best buddies is. Um... It it appears to be a national organization. Yeah, international. Yep. So your your uh, position is here in Connecticut. Yeah, I'm the Connecticut state director. All right. On. But yeah, I mean, unfortunately, I had to, you know, with times now, and and we rely on donors and oh, yeah. companies and um, foundations, schools being open, schools being open. <laughs> so we have adapted. We're doing a lot of stuff virtually now for inclusion. Mm. Um, because people that we uh, advocate for are have felt excluded for a very long time. And so when we're in times like this, it makes it even worse. So we've really changed a lot of the ways that we're doing things and doing a lot of things virtually. So it's making... Um, Thank goodness for technology. Yes, absolutely. However yeah. quirky it, might, it may be. <laughs> right. So. As of one thirty today, today is April 1st, uh, we're switching back to the COVID stuff. There was a total confirmed case number of 3,557 people. Mm-hmm. Uh, the majority seem Positive to be... Positive tests in Connecticut? Yes, out of, yeah. out of 16,600 people tested. Yeah. Um, what? Oh, we've tested 16,000? That's up. Good for us. That's what it says. Yeah. It was sl- it was slow for a while. There was a thousand today. I think part of the you know it's interesting you say that because um, I was working with Chespercott actually, mm-hmm. and a lot of the problem was we weren't there was such a lag time between when the test would be taken and the results being um, gotten into the health districts because the health districts need that information if some of our first responders have to go to someone's house, whether it's fire or police or ambulance, they need to know if somebody has COVID, right? And so the lag time was tremendous. And what they found out was because doctors are prescribing so many tests, because they have to, they're afraid not to. Um, And then the labs were getting so overwhelmed. It was taking a few days to get the numbers out. So it has started, that has started to um, condense a little bit. So now the numbers are flowing. I know yesterday there was a thousand new um, people tested. So um, that's, that's helped. And I think there- 1,000 in one day? 1,000 in one day. Yep. So New York is testing about 20,000 a day. Yeah. So I think that we are, um, I think that even our, our hospitals are now- um, I don't want to say getting in a routine, but for lack of a better word, they've got now the drive-through testing that helps, um, you know, people can go and get tested with a doctor's notice, a doctor's prescription and all. So I think that's kind of smoothing out a little bit um, as far as that process. So what, what is, what else is the state doing to um, curb the spread or stop the spread or slow it? Well, um, continually tell people to, um, you know, social distancing and, and or physical distancing is the best thing and kind of always preaching that and washing your hands. Um, some of the, um, you know, the new executive orders about and some of them are unclear. Some towns have closed parks. Some towns haven't. Um, you know, beaches were a huge problem for a while. Um, so I think they're really trying to, I know young kids. Wait uh, till spring hits here. Wait I till spring know. hits. So, and a, a perfect example, my um, neighbor, his mother is 80 and she got tested positive. She found out today that she's positive. And he's like, mom, where have you been? And he hasn't seen her in two weeks. And she was like saying, well, I only went a couple of places. Well, she was going to diners. She was out at the grocery stores all the time. It's like, you sh- don't you know better? You know, you should know better than to do those kinds of things. So I think people just really have to be, I know my family, we, we don't really go out. 
I go to the grocery store. That is it. When we walk, we walk in our neighborhood. Um, well, if I had your wine cellar, I probably wouldn't go out either. <laughs> How do you know about my wine cellar? <laughs> there's, there's like a four page article in a wine magazine. I was going to get to that. I don't think it's four pages, but anyway. And so, um, but I think that, um, you know, putting some of these place things, executive orders and, and but people have to take responsibility. That's the bottom line. Well, you can put everything. If, if, if the state knows the nation, if the nation knows that people are looking to looking for guidance they're looking for how to how to behave they're looking for cues from national guidance from local guidance and i find that the longer it takes for local guidance to issue a, a stay a stay at home order still some states still do not have stay at home orders florida just issued one today april 1st i think that people, I think people feel thought that it was it's okay joke. to go out it, the woman was going to a diner. It was still open. Yeah. If that think, diner was closed. She would not have been able to go. That's true. And so I think that people, um, I think you're right. But I also, and I also think people want to know the future, what is going to happen. And no one knows that. But when, oh, we know most of it. All you have to do is look to Italy, look well, to China. Yes. And it, um, and it's not, it's not a secret. Our friend, I actually have a friend in China. He's in Lombardia, I guess is how you pronounce it. And they he's been in his apartment 20 days and it just started going down, the numbers. Um, I mean, they're still getting positive. People are still dying, but it, he, they feel that um, he has been tracking it in the last two days. It's been going down. So I just hope and pray. And, you know, I've been hearing two weeks about Easter somewhere around there is going to be the peak. And I hope that that's true because we do need to get, people need to get back to work. People need to, you know, businesses need to start operating again. And, um, but we have to get through it. We have to get through it. And then people have to get back to work. I think, I know people are concerned with the economy and I can see why, because we cannot live after this without an economy booming. And I understand the way that America works, where we are a, we're kind of like a democratic, you know, we're, we're very commercial and we want our businesses to be able to run freely. And we're like a democratic capitalist nation. (laughs) We're like a nice little mix of the two, but we're talking about the economy, of course, because it's on our minds, but we don't even have PPE in our hospitals and it just seems so jumbled. And I just, I, I know this is new for everybody and I know how could you be prepared for something like this? And I know, you know, Easter was, was going to be our, our kind of like our tentative back to work date. And then it got switched to Easter might be our peak, but we do have to get back to work, but uh, we have to stem this tide, uh, you know, 200,000 to 2.2 million people might, might have, you know, lost their battle to this sickness prior to, you know, a three week time period. And it's just, I, I, it's so hard to find that balance between, you know, the human suffering and the economy suffering. And it's, it's so, we're so in the throes of it right now. I, I don't even know how to process the economy starting again when I don't even know if I'm going to be safe in three weeks. It's such a horrible right. state of inertia that we're in right now. Right. I just hope that the people who need help as far as economically right now, the people who are maybe left out of the stimulus bill because they were just fired or, yeah. you know, I just, I hope people find themselves in homes at the end of this. It's right. what a tragic Mostly my, my thing is I want everybody to be fed through this. I just hope everybody can find food to feed their families before yeah. this is done. Supply yeah. chain. Yes. Um, yeah, it, it, it is time. Times are, are um, scary and tough. Different. And they are different. And I think people, people are, there are people that are suffering and physically and emotionally. And, um, but I have seen, I've seen restaurants come out. I just saw something today where this restaurant in Oxford, um, they've closed and all they're doing is feeding people. They don't ask any question. If you call them and say, we need food, they come and drop it off for you. And so I do think people are coming together 
Um, you know, it's completely different than 9-11, but, you know, in, mm. for me, that's the only thing that I can see when people really, we came out neighborly with compassion and helping people. And I've started to see that with people now. Um, you know, I, people come out, they're calling on elderly people in town to say, I'm going to the store. Can I get you something? Um, so I just, I hope we continue that, that, uh, doing that until this passes. And, and I hope that we have a bigger bond. And I think you said it, you know, coming out together as a nation and being closer and, and, uh, more respectful and more kind to everybody. Hopefully when people are doing these nice things for their neighbors, they're also taking in consideration that, uh, we're dealing with a highly contagious disease or virus that, you know, uh, you know, decontaminating the groceries you drop off, you know, being careful what you touch, taking all those precautions, or better yet, uh, contacting your local um, uh, health organization, Chesh Perkat, the, uh, the, the human services organization, and either uh, seeing about volunteering with them, making a donation to them. Uh, more or less, what I, I guess what I'm getting at is let the professionals handle it for the safety of those people that you care so much about, you know? I just had a delivery oh, delivered yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, oh, I'm not saying go okay. in there. Right. <laughs> I just had a delivery delivered to the go- pantry. That helps, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm not saying go in and sit down and have coffee with them. <laughs> right. But, you know, if they need something, um, a, a roll of toilet paper or laundry detergent or something, just put it at their doorstep. I right. Mean, I think, um, you know. We can all be, I have a, an older gentleman across from me and his family can't come see him. I mean, you know, they can't. So neighbors um, helping neighbors is a positive. My, my 92 year old grandmother's all by herself. Oh, see. Right. Yeah. And sometimes our our 99 year old grandmother, we wanted to go see her and wave, but we didn't just wave through the window, but we're going to FaceTime instead. Yes. Your, See technology. Your ninety-nine year old your your ninety-nine year old grandmother knows how to FaceTime. I was gonna say that's impressive. Yeah, she she lives on her own. She lives I'm impressed because she FaceTime. I tried talking. She my, Facebook. Yeah, I tried talking to my grandmother. She's not through Facebook. It. Forget it. Um. So Leslie, I want to circle back before we go. Yes. Because I'm sitting here and I'm I am having a glass of wine. I noticed that. And. uh Wine Spectator uh, had a nice little spread. Um, looks t- t- what? Oh, sorry, sorry, I was being attacked by a cat. Oh, okay. sorry. Um, <laughs> it looks like uh, you and your husband are quite the wine connoisseurs. Is that correct? Um, we do. We like wine. Um, my husband did that uh, by hand, all by himself. So. We would have never been able to do it if he didn't do it. It took him. That was his five-year project. Yeah, well, the story is interesting because um, I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, reusing things, um, repurposing wood, especially lumber. Um, And uh, your your husband, can I say his name? Sure, Greg. Greg. Uh, He he works for an energy company. They were doing um, uh, a wind energy project. Um, Ooh. and yeah. uh on the on the land was uh some some i believe it was yeah, cherry he black cherry black cherry so he, and yeah, he, he took the wood and that's the wood he used to build the yeah. cellar correct yeah yep yeah, he did it all himself it was um, it, when i tell you five years it was five years well, I, I know and, i'm i'm working on a nine-year edition out in the oh, back yeah. so i, I get yeah. it my well i don't get it my wife will relate to you. Yeah, it took a quarantine for my basement to get painted, but hey, <laughs> here we are. I, we, I love all it. Of our, we we stacked and split all of our wood for next winter yesterday, so we're done with that project. Nice. So when when he built this, he he did all the milling, everything. Well, he, he took it to a mill, okay. but he and when I tell you, he cut, uh, you know, like one inch beveled edge little uh, pieces of wood and stained them and. A uh, labor of love. It was. He he really did. Um, I'm very happy for him because 
um, he did it really a great job and we, we enjoy it and it's fun and it's a personal project for him. Well, and, and it was finished. Look at that. Yeah. Five years though. Come on. <laughs> yes. Still. But it's he a, just said nine years and he's not kidding. It's <laughs> a, uh, it's a 15, is it 15 or 1800 bottle? Oh God. I don't know. I don't even know. I don't. I, it's, do you I, not drink the wine? You just collect it? Some of it I do drink. Yeah, we do drink. Okay. We like wine. Okay. That's our, that's kind of our little thing. Um, that's your vice. Everybody needs a vice. It, it is. And um, we enjoy it and we love learning about it and all. So um, that's, that's his hobby. So is one of his what, hobbies. what's your hobby then? What is my hobby? You know what I love to do? Scrapbooking. Oh yeah. I love the scrapbook and I love to garden. My- Those are my. Happy. My aunt, I um, garden as well. My aunt runs uh, these scrapbooking conventions all the time. Where, yes. oh yeah, there, there's like 40, 50 people that show yeah. up and they sit all day and they scrapbook. My, I do. I'm one of those. Yep, my daughter, my, my it's very crafty. My daughter does that. My my aunt's name is Holly Stowe. I don't know if you know her or not. Oh, I'm very far behind because I never get a chance to do it. But well, you're gonna uh, have to. I'll have to introduce you to her, and then I you can go that. and do one or things. And I have to ask you, Trish, what kind of you garden? Vegetable, flowers, both, everything. Uh, so you name it, and I'll garden it. But this year is the first year where I I'm from the Bronx, so I've always container gardened outside. But inside, I I have house plants, some of which I've had for 25, 30 years. Mm. But I. I just recently, I have orchids. I love orchids. And I get them to bloom for me in spectacular fashion. I don't know how I give them all the credit, but one plant I needed to split up and one orchid now became nine orchids. So I can't wait to see if I can get them to flower. Nice. We'll have to, that could be another segment. I would love to talk to you about that. (laughs) I love, I have so many, I have so many plants, probably more than, way more than I should, but. I make them from them, so it's not are like you, I hoard them. Are you going to garden outside at all? So last year, since moving to the country, yeah. last year <laughs> for um, <laughs> this is the country for me, <laughs> South Worksville. Um, last year, my my family, my boys, made for Mother's Day. They made me a raised bed garden. Oh, so ooh. yeah. So I it was my first year ever doing it, but I learned so much because I've always done container gardening all the time. I've grown every, all the things you can grow in containers and we eat, we eat from it. Yeah. My kids love eating right off the vine. But one thing I will pass on is I've never grown tomatoes, not in a container. So last year I did a tomato in the ground. It took over my enti- half of my entire garden. You got to do those tomatoes right. Yeah, I so. I had garden I, and I I'm an expert over. at growing tomatoes and you have to you have to maintain them the right way. You have to clip the little sla- uh, yeah. saplings in them. You got to you got to trim them so they don't get too tall. I was getting tomatoes. Yeah. I was getting tomatoes that had to be 3 pounds. Yeah. yeah. They were the most delicious tomatoes I've ever eaten. They were just but delicious and beautiful, but it overtook my peppers. That's because you and didn't maintain it. And then it started to encroach on my... Yeah. You I, hack. They, it, just, it just grew. So you keep them like a bonsai? Yeah, you got you to gotta trim. You gotta, they're a lot yeah. of work, man. And you got to tie them up. Yeah. I, they were tied. The bigger they grew, you, the more I had to clip tie them. them. If they weren't damaged. Did, they weren't damaged. Did, I just let them You got to clip all the suckers and, out. Yeah. If you don't clip the suckers, then they grow out of control. Uh, it was... It was, they were, will, it was I will like show the you. plant from, yeah. Oh, it's wonderful. I, I loved the tomatoes. Unfortunately, I'm the only one in my house that eats tomatoes. Whereas I was they growing all so many com- tomatoes. I was giving them away to my neighbors. I was like, please take these. I, oh, Corey, make sauce. I was eating like I, two tomatoes I had a, a day. I had a freezer My life full of sauce. Are you kidding me? I had so much sauce. It was out of control. I still have sauce. Now I know why. Now Sauce I know why people ears. are always giving away tomatoes, though. Whenever anybody gardens, they always show up to you with like a bag of tomatoes. Now I know why. <laughs> yeah, they're, <laughs> right, they're, they're nuts. There's so many. But there's nothing it, like a fresh garden tomato. Especially still warm from the sun with just Wonderful. a little, I put a little tiny bit of salt on it and I just slice it and eat it just like that. Oh, it's delicious. Speaking of vegetables, uh, before we go, one more before we go, uh, how you voting on uh, the marijuana thing? Uh, I'm, I'm not for marijuana. Uh-oh. 
I'm not, you know why I was a ranking member on public safety uh-huh. for two years, one term. And I don't believe we are in a place right now. Um, you know, the testing is not there. Um, you don't know how high is too high. We don't know. I actually talked to um, my sister lives in Utah. And when I fly to visit her, if someone's from Colorado, I said, we got to talk pot. And so I've talked, I talked to a person and they actually put me in contact with the head lobbyist that passed it uh-huh. in Colorado. And I had an hour conversation with this woman and she says, no, I'm obviously glad it passed, but we went too big, too fast. It needs to be in a couple of different agencies, not just one agency. Um, I just, I don't believe that we are at a point for that right now. Maybe down the road, who knows? Medicinal but, um, or recreational? Well, medicinal is already legal in Connecticut. Yeah. Municipal is legal. Um, but recreational, I just, I don't, I don't think that we were. we're what is the big thing with that? Taxes, tax revenue. Why is that being pushed? Because certain people want it. They say tax, but what are we going to do? Promote it to everybody to smoke pots. So we get tax revenue from it. What it's, is it? I bet the revenue in Massachusetts is ridiculous. I would have done some research, but I'm sure it's man. But I see but everything is a double edged. That's sword. a whole, that's everything. a whole nother show. Do, do what your, <laughs> do what your voters want you to do. That's yeah. what you do. That's right. Hey, yeah. You know, at least you answered honestly and not, uh, you know, not to appease my my, uh, my opinion. So I give you that. That you have an opinion, Corey? What's your opinion? Oh, I, I'm 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 for legalizing all drugs across the board. That's why I said it's a whole other show. Well, yeah. alcohol is legal. Yeah, I know. Why do you? Why are you? Just out of curiosity, why are you legalizing all like even heroin? Even heroin. I think that why? I think when when you legalize everything, you you can then. Uh, turn the uh, uh, you can you can make the drug addicts ex- uh, access to assistance uh, even easier because you can you can right, cause the stigma, you can use stigma? you can use bad money for good and I think ultimately you solve a problem and you get rid of the the the, the drug crimes you get rid of the drug smuggling you get rid of a, a lot of things go away when it's legal but you know even when drugs go legal there's still a black market for drugs of course there's a black market for that somewhere? but the if you even even if you Holland, look at the black maybe? market for for guns it's much smaller than it was uh you know than it would be if guns were illegal how, across do, the you, board. how board. do you measure a black market you have to measure by crime stats unfortunately oh that sounds so interesting yeah. And, and, and like, so now they're talking about vaping and all, but then they say, well, we want to do away with flavors, but then the black market's going to explode. So we, we, it's okay to do, and I'm not saying I'm for it against it. I'm just saying, so people will say, okay, so it's okay to put flavors of vaping into the black market, but not, you know, pot. And I don't personally think people that smoke pot now that you get it from the guy down the street that, you know, for whatever you're not going to then turn around and go into a store and pay an exorbitant amount of money and all these taxes, you're still going to get it from your guy down the street. So that Mm -hmm. hasn't been, uh, I haven't been convinced of that yet. Um, So it's interesting though, but it's tough to get statistics on stuff. That's illegal. It it, It it is is true. It is, it is, it is very difficult. And, and like I said, you know, I mean, it, it is a whole nother show and and my my interesting though. my thoughts yeah. around it are very very radical and i understand that that's why it's you know i'm not you must be a libertarian i i am a little bit yes i am a libertarian <laughs> he's a little bit of everything <laughs> um i mean if you if you take those tests on facebook that determine your political leaning it always lands somewhere on the libertarian scale <laughs> um but you, you know what i like to say leslie is uh i i am who i am um right. and Absolutely. You know, as I've grown and gotten older, my opinion on things has has evolved. Um, you know, mm-hmm. what I used to be uh, against, I'm now for. Um, you know, you have a family, and your thought process changes on things. You 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 know, you get into one major car accident, and your process on how healthcare works changes. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so many things that have you you become friends with Trisha, and all of a sudden your mind starts thinking differently of of honestly of women. Um, I mean, even though I have a daughter and I was married, uh, you know, my relationship and my bond with Trisha has completely changed my, my, my outlook. Things change as you, as you grow. That's a good thing. Absolutely. I hope for the better. My gosh, that's a lot of pressure. Absolutely for the better. better. 
Um, but I mean, those are life experiences that we all learn from. Correct. Right? And that's so, most getting, of us should at least. Yeah. You hope so. You hope so. <laughs> right. I hope so right. with my kids anyway. Yeah. You know, I know. I know. Distance learning. Speaking of kids, what a great experience. This has been tough, impossible <laughs> at times, but we can do it. It's something that can be done. And look how much safer we all are because we could do it. I give so much credit to teachers right now. I just recently wrote another email and I said, um, you know, thank you. I know how tough this is. And I know I keep saying, um, you know, I appreciate all your effort. But every time I write it, I mean it a little bit more <laughs> because I've written, I've corresponded with teachers as we're, we run into a hiccup and they fix it. And we run into a hiccup and they fix it. And I just say, thank you so much for this effort. But then I realized I put it at the end of every email. So now I'm, I truly mean it. I thank the teachers for this effort that they are going yeah. without it. Can you imagine what our lives would be without our kids being able to continue education right now? I mean, what a different boat we would all be in. It's no, the, it, it, the way it, that it, Americans are rising to the challenge of this crisis gives me hope that we won't ignore it once we're over it. We will fix what need, what what we're finding is broken. We'll fix it on the other side. Absolutely. That's, that's right. So, Leslie, I'd like to thank you for joining us. I hope you had fun. Thank you. Very brave I of did. you. Thank, thank you. you. No, no. Thank you for having me. And I wish health and and strength to you and to everybody that listens to this. And, and we will, we'll all make it through it. We'll survive. We'll be stronger. We just have to stick to that through the hard times, right? Amen. So, Trisha, thank, thank you. Everybody. Yeah. Anytime you want to come on, I, I'd love have, to have you again. Uh, I think we will. We'll have anyway. you on the other side of this crisis when things definitely when we can have normalize. you in studio and we can have a glass of wine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trisha? I'll have my seltzer. You'll have, yeah, right, seltzer. Trisha, thank you again for uh, being my faithful companion in this adventure that is the Cheshire Cast. You're welcome, Corey. Thank you for keeping it going. Uh, well, I'm only responsible for 50%. And I'd like <laughs> okay. to thank all our listeners again. Uh, like I always say, uh, you can get us on all of your favorite apps, um, Stitcher, uh, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Podbean. Trisha, any more that I'm forgetting? Yeah, you can't think of them either. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> if you like what you're hearing, give us a, give us five-star review. Uh, it helps us. It helps us expand our reach. Um, and every week, we're like growing and, and share. growing. Yeah, like and share on Facebook. Uh We'll soon have. And thanks for listening. Yes, and we'll soon have our Patreon up. We'll soon have our uh, Instagram and our Twitter feeds going. We've got a whole bunch of cool stuff happening. Uh, we've got uh, the new theme song is in the works. I just sent a uh, a demo to Trisha. No, you better stop it. That's not a demo. You heard the demo, right? <laughs> no, that's the demo. That's, that's a demo of the the first the first lyrics. <laughs> you just wait. Don't you dare. <laughs> Oh, just wait, so, I'm sorry, everyone. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know, you know. Maybe the next few renditions <laughs> it'll <laughs> Corey, I'm still laughing at it. Yeah, that's the point. <laughs> are you gonna sing it or are you gonna have oh, somebody no. else sing oh, it? Oh no. Oh, I'll tell you offline who's singing it. It's awesome. When when okay. when you hear who's gonna <laughs> Is it you? Oh no no no. No, I, okay, I'm good, going good. completely pro with this one. Oh you're gosh. gonna love it. So everybody say yeah, goodbye. Wait. Bye. Bye, everybody. Stay well. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Let's get out of here. Like now. Okay, so I'll see you later, huh? I'll give you a call. Okay, see you later, pal. Amigos, time to depart. <laughs>